Leonardo da Vinci. Time now for Sunday School with Michael Enright. You too can be a 10-minute scholar. On Sunday School this morning, we're going to look at the theory and practice of the so-called just war. With all the recent talk about possible military strikes against Syria, we thought that would be an appropriate lesson for Sunday School. Specifically, what, if anything, makes a war just? I'm joined by John Berkman. He's professor of moral theology at Regis College in the University of Toronto, and he's with me in our studio in Toronto this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Enright. Professor, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> the, ju- the theory of the just war, it's been, a long, it's been around, I guess, as long as war has been around, really. Yes, it goes back right to the Greeks. To the Greeks? Yes. Um, okay, well, just give us an early, a description of the early. How did it come about? Why, okay. why was the word just applied to something so awful as war? Well, for someone like Aristotle, uh, he was trying to overcome uh, certain kinds of cultures, Spartan cultures, other martial cultures that simply glorified war as an end in itself. And contrary to that culture, Aristotle thought that you must have some kind of just purpose for war. You must try to recover some injury or bring back about some justice. Before going to war. Well, before going to war, that must be the purpose in going to war. You couldn't just be because you feel like beating up on somebody else because you want to flex your muscles like the neighborhood or school schoolyard or Sunday school bully. Right. Now... It became uh, refined, is that the word, with St. Augustine? Is that, did he, he had a theory. St. Augustine is the man who, I love his quote, he said, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Yes, I, I, Augustine I, had a rather yeah, uh, tumultuous yeah. life. <laughs> and uh, he's really what I want to call the, the father of just war theory, in that he brought it into the Christian tradition. Augustine acknowledged that in the first few centuries of Christianity, Christianity was basically a pacifist or nonviolent faith. And, uh, but Augustine saw an opportunity uh, with some changing historical circumstances uh, that this might be part of what it meant to be faithful as a Christian, that there could be kinds of engagements in war that could actually be good, faithful uh, Christian discipleship. How did he square that with commandment number six, which says, as I understand it, thou shalt not kill? Yes. Well, he believed thou shalt not kill. And uh, he thought humans could not ever kill on their own accord. And uh, that uh, uh, was only in God's hands. Only God uh, could do engage in killing. But he thought there were two situations in which God shared that authority or delegated that authority to human beings. And one could be, in certain cases, those in governmental authority, those with the authority to govern people, uh, could have that authority. Uh, And the second case, where uh, kind of a a somewhat more obscure case, but uh, a few cases where God might command somebody directly to kill, such as the famous case of Abraham and Isaac. Right, Uh, But we can leave that one aside for the moment. Uh, But rather, Augustine's view of the possibility of just war that could only be exercised by a legitimate authority. I read somewhere that um, some people in justifying a just war mm-hmm. point out that Christ said, I come with a sword, or um, I forgot the quote, but <laughs> I, think I, I come not with like, a, yes, but something with a like sword. Those who live by the side die by the sword and so forth. And Augustine took up all these passages rather seriously. He took them very seriously. And uh, what one has to understand is, I, and I think he interpreted this as those who did not have legitimate authority. Now, I should also step back. And there's something very important to understand uh, in Augustine's own time and historical context, and that is in the first three centuries, Christians had a fairly dim view of governmental authority. You typically do have a dim view of governmental authority when they're throwing your kids or your parents or your friends to the lions uh, periodically. And so you uh, don't tend to think too much good can come out of them. But of course, one of the most famous uh, transformations in the late uh, ancient world was, of course, the the conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity. On the road to Damascus, was it (laughs) Damascus? His own kind of quasi-road to Damascus And he saw the cross in the sky. Yes. Yes. And so, and suddenly you have to understand that basically within one generation, you go from a situation where either Christians couldn't be, or it was very dubious for them to be part of the military, Though there were, there were counterexamples, and we could get into the specifics, but I'm not sure that's key. But anyway, within one generation or two, 
you go from a situation where basically no Christians are in the military to if you want to be in the military, you have to, in some sense, be quote unquote Christian. Um, and so suddenly, um, Constantine basically demands this. And so suddenly Augustine is faced with a kind of situation. Well, perhaps maybe God can work through the government. There were certainly scripture passages in St. Paul and elsewhere that seem to indicate, for example, in Paul's letter, the Romans chapter 13, about God working through governmental authorities to punish evildoers. So the government could be considered, in effect, God's agent on earth. That's what Augustine is saying in certain okay. cases. Yes. And, and Augustine even saw this as a fulfillment of a certain kind of prophecy, that there might come a time when suddenly you had governments who could act for the good. All right, the Dominican, Thomas Aquinas. Yes. He, what did he do with the theory? He was also very important in terms of developing it or yes. renovating it in some way. Augustine, as uh, the greatest of all uh, medieval theologians and arguably the, the greatest theologian in the history of... Aquinas. Uh, Aquinas, I'm yeah. sorry, uh, Aquinas, the greatest theologian in the history of the Catholic Church. He basically uh, took up some developments that were going on in the centuries in the 13th century. In the 11th and 12th century, you had a kind of organization of a lot of church teaching by Gratian and his decretum and other places. And Aquinas basically comes up with three key criteria of the just war. And he kind of lists them out. One, of course, we've talked about legitimate authority. Okay. Uh, the second one, uh, and he really takes these over from uh, Augustine, but adds a few things to them. One is just cause. There must be a serious injustice that has to the be... Casus bellum. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the third is that you have to uh, engage in war with the right intent. And this is actually a very important one, and it's very important to understand what both Augustine and Aquinas mean by right intent, because it's very different from modern sure. thinking about war. And the right intent, it was fundamentally other-directed. The purpose of war was not to vanquish the enemy, but to um, ultimately, and Augustine and Aquinas took this very seriously, you had to love your enemy. And actually in fighting them, I know this sounds psychologically impossible, and for modern warriors, it is psychologically impossible, but they believe that this was a kind of love of enemy to basically uh, bring them and reconcile with them to bring them back to overcome the wrongs done and to return to a peaceable and just society. Were these wars of conversion in some way? It wasn't like the Crusades. No, no. they were not religious wars. Neither Augustine nor Aquinas thought that you could engage in war for religious reasons. You couldn't just because they were Muslims or somebody else go to war against them. They did not believe that at all. And in fact, a just war could not be for any ideological purpose, if it was rightly understood. It had to be for some very specific um, uh, material kind of purpose, uh, righting a particular wrong, and once that wrong was righted, which had to be declared in advance, uh -huh. and once that wrong was righted, um, that had to be stopped. So the idea of, in, of some sense in the Middle Ages of Crusades, where it's like, we're fighting for God, or of course, the modern crusade, of course, we're fighting for freedom and democracy. Right. Uh, those are equally, there's just kind of religious and secular crusades. Uh, these are completely foreign to the just war. So in that sense, if you think back to the Gulf War in 1990, uh, George Bush uh, Sr. Senior. got into trouble because uh, once uh, Saddam's troops were out of Kuwait, he said, okay, war's over. Yeah. And according yeah. to Just War, that was exactly right. Now, people said, well, why don't you go ahead and get Saddam out of there? Yeah. Um, but uh, he, according to Just War, what was the purpose of it? He was exactly right to end the war when the purpose was concluded. Also, there's a question of proportionality. There yes. has to, the, the, the war has to be proportional. I've been told, and I, I don't know if this is right, mm -hmm. that the theory of an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth was so specific that it was to prevent people from going and wiping out entire villages or destroying entire civilizations, that it was to be proportional and discriminating. Yes, I think one can certainly argue that very kind of ancient command of an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was to kind of overcome the Hatfield and McCoy syndrome, where you simply... Uh, <laughs> goes on uh, and on It goes and on, on and, and on, kill everybody. you know, or certain kind of mafia wars where it just kind of extends on and on, and they were trying to stop that and get that be done with. So arguably the eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was a kind of... Um, putting some kind of morality into these feuds, blood feuds. Um, uh, but then, of course, uh, uh, the Christian tradition is trying to go beyond that. The Christian tradition is not interested in eye for an eye or tooth for tooth. Um, uh, it's actually, in war, it's supposed to be doing it out of love for the enemy and, uh, and for the good and bringing that, that person or those people back to a kind of reconciliation. Uh, and so it's very important to understand that uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, war was not just a theory, 
but it involved a set of practices. You can imagine the kind of training you would have to give to a military sure. to fight in a way that you were sad killers. I mean, when you think of modern military. Sad killers. Yeah, My modern God. military, I mean, you depersonalize the enemy, right? They're a goose or a hun yeah. or an insect or yeah. a, a cockroach that has to be stamped out. In the Christian tradition, uh, wars were in some sense other directed in that you were looking for the good of the enemy. I know that is so foreign to the modern thought, but this is really the classical Christian tradition of just war. But isn't every war just to the victor? It may be, but uh, they may be wrong. And here is another difference, I think, between the classical tradition. You have to understand, certainly in the medieval tradition, those um, who could engage uh, in just war, say various princes or kings or emperors, yeah. there was another authority which in some sense they had to yield to. I mean, two things. Augustine and certainly Aquinas noted that any kind of prince who was thinking about going to war had to have wise advisors who would give wise counsel. Augustine did not think your typical prince could um, wisely make a decision about whether it would be just to go to war. And so you had to have counselors, not sycophants, yeah. um, but real counselors. And secondly, uh, once you have it in the context of the church, certain ecclesial authorities would, could also step in and make judgments. Okay, this prince is, is just and this prince is unjust. In the classical tradition, both sides cannot be just. Uh, only one side can be just. But of course, see, in modernity, where you have autonomous and sovereign, uh, sovereign states. nation states, yeah, yeah. they recognize no central moral authority. And if that, you want, Is that why, sorry to interrupt yes, you, but no, is, that why, is that why uh, God is on everybody's side? I mean, you see... Uh, I think of St. Crispin's Day, the great speech, uh, Prince Hal, mm -hmm. um, that those who are asleep in England are going to rue the day they weren't here killing the, anim you know, killing the enemy. And you have padres and people marching off to war with God on their side. Onward, Christian soldiers. Yes. Come on. Well, uh, uh, much of the Christian tradition, I think, gets perverted in this and comes to a glorification of war, a love of war, the assumption that one's country, one's people must be in the right. And the classic just war tradition would never have countenanced that. It wouldn't be jingoism and all of that? I mean, it wouldn't... Not properly understood. Really? How can it be jingoist if you're sad killers? This is not yeah, about yeah. Uh, marching to onward Christian soldiers happily off to war to, to kill the, you can name the, uh, the term, the nasty term you use for the enemy. This is not what the tradition was about. And of course, part of the great problem of the just war tradition is uh, the Christian tradition's inability to maintain the discipline to actually carry it out and not succumb to nationalistic pride. So are, are you saying then that the, the theory of the just war has been traduced and bastardized and, and it no, no long, there's no such thing anymore? Is that what you're saying? It's close to that. I would say when you Look, since, since about 1990, everybody wants to be a just warrior, right? Everybody says, I'm going to fight a just war. I mean, who wants Look to be an Syria, unjust warrior? Right? And um, basically, this is simply a kind of public policy checklist, which you check off after you've already decided you're going to go to war. It's not like you think, okay, can I go to war? Is, would it be just? No, you say, I'm going to go to war. And now I'm going to check off the checklist so I kind of cover my moral backside uh, and so that it's okay. And frankly, this modern notion of just war with the kind of public policy checklist has little or nothing to do with the classical tradition of just war. But politicians... Yeah. use it and refer of course they revert do. to it on every occasion. Of course they you do. You remember Mrs. Thatcher when she sent the ships down the Atlantic to the Falklands. This was a just war. Yeah. Now, interestingly, um, some serious historians of just war actually pull out the Falklands as perhaps one example of a real just the war. Last I'm, just I'm not going to get into <laughs> whether I think that is in fact true. So it's funny that you should pull that out as an example, but I certainly think uh, in con contrary to that, um, and that doesn't mean I'm defending uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, jingoistic ways right. in that. But, um, uh, but leaving that aside, I think you need to very sharply separate uh, politician speak from serious moral reflection. Because part of what fighting a just war means, uh, it means a number of things, but one is it means uh, those who are going to fight it have to be trained to do so in a truly honorable way, right. which I don't think if you hear all kinds of anecdotes about the way militaries carry on. It's so far from that. But secondly, it's a recognition. See, just war is not actually that far 
as one might think from pacifism, because if it can't be a just war, then you can't fight. So for Christians who are just warriors, it may require them to lay down their arms and not fight or to stop fighting at some point. Okay, just war doesn't mean we decided to just war and we're just going to fight on until it's over with. There can be a variety of, of reasons why uh, people fighting, serious just warriors would have to say, no, we can't fight. Even if they kill us, we will not fight on. But the one overarching reason, uh, certainly in modern times, is yes. if, if an army or if a sovereign state is on a massive industrial scale butchering civilians, let's say, yes. killing six million Jews or, yes. or gassing, you know, surely the, uh, the natural inclination is to say, well, if we go in and stop that, we're acting in a just way. It's a, it's yes. a just Well, there would certainly be a just cause. A just cause. There would certainly be a just cause. There would certainly be one of the conditions. But of course, when you think about uh, how the Allies engaged in obliteration bombing of Germany, uh, mass slaughter of innocent civilians, uh, and of course we know about how the British bomber commands uh, were kind of sloughed off and not praised after the war because Britain kind of retrospectively recognized what they were engaged in was evil. And in Japan. And, the and, fire, and of course, the fire Hiroshima, of course, of course. And um, so there were all kinds of atrocities that were not part of just war that engaged in World War II. But I want to say one larger point. Who was fighting primarily, at least in the Western theater in World War II? It was a bunch of German Catholics and some German Lutherans That's and right. some Italian Catholics and a bunch of French Catholics and a bunch of English Protestants. Now, doesn't see ironic that all these Christians are killing each other at the command of a secular or a profane nation state leader? Now, you also have to step back and ask this larger question about the mass, I would say, apostasy going on, that all these Christians would be killing each other for their secular master. This is the problem of just war, uh, that uh, the Christians haven't been That's able to live it out. Yeah. And uh, the, the discipline of just war has been totally, you know, or largely abandoned. And uh, most Christians are not either just warriors or pacifists or even realists, kind of real politic, which is another problem. They're basically what a famous pacifist, John Howard Yoder, called blank checkers, which means they'll do whatever their democratically elected government tells them to do without much reflection. And they're certainly not sad killers. And they're certainly not sad killers. Thank you so much for coming in. It's a pleasure to meet you on the radio, and this is absolutely intriguing. I do, knew nothing about this, and now I know a little bit. Well, thank you, and I hope that it's been a helpful Sunday school lesson. It certainly has. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. John Berkman is professor of moral theology at Regis College in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. He's with me. He was with me in our studio here. You're listening to the Sunday edition. My name is Michael.